Hello, I'm Josephine Burton and welcome back to the Dash Arts podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. Earlier in the year, we began a mini episode series on protest songs, particularly looking at songs sung across Europe as part of our eUtopia series of work, which culminates this year. We began with the Internationale and I spoke to the wonderful Billy Bragg and Professors John Street and Robert Service about the song and its ongoing relevance today. Our Dash Arts production of Middlemarch then completely absorbed us, but all the while we've been watching protests across the world and particularly growing strike action in the UK over the last few months, and we've been biding our time to return to protest songs and a song that I particularly love, Bella Ciao. <laughs> And so I picked up the phone to Philip Cook, Professor of Italian History and Culture at the University of Strathclyde, to find out more about the song. When we started to think about um, protest songs, um, it, was, it was pretty obvious to me that Bella Ciao should be one of those songs on the list, partly because completely selfishly, I want to know more about it. Like, I'm, I know it's an Italian song. I know it's got an extraordinary history. I keep coming across adaptations and versions of that song being sung around the world in India and in, in Gezi Park in Turkey and in South America. And so it's a sort of anthem for protest. And I wanted to sort of go back a little bit to understand it that context and the history are you able to help i'll give a i'll i'll, I'll try as best as best i can but i mean b- before i start giving you a history lecture which i'm going to avoid uh, i mean i think you're absolutely right about uh, about how kind of congenial a song bella ciao is and, and how it's really easy to belt it out and how people can learn it very e- easily as well so i mean it's an it's an italian song but even if you don't know even if you can't sing the lyrics you can all sing bella ciao and uh, I think that's one of the reasons that the song was proved so popular internationally and, um, and not just in Italy. But anyway, to take you back to, then to the, the, the context, we need to go back to the Second World War and, um, and specifically to the period 1943 to 1945, you know, roughly from September 43 to April 1945, when the um, Italian resistance movement is formed, the resistance movement that uh, fights against the Germans and and, uh, fights uh, against Mussolini's fascists as well, with the assistance of the the British and the other allied forces that are in Italy at the time. So um, the partisans, many uh, young people um, hiding in in the mountains, uh, staging attacks, against um against the germans against the fascists blowing up um railway lines this 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 kind of thing and um one of the things that they that they that they do when they're not engaged in these kind of actions is to you know try and keep their spirits up and uh and this can involve all sorts of activities but singing is uh, is one of them in the same way that you have a a sing song at the end of your Meetings and so um, during this period, as I said, forty-three to forty-five, you get a uh, you get a lot of um, resistance. Um, you get a lot of resistance songs, and um, probably the most famous of them isn't Bella Ciao. It's a song called Fischia Event or the winds blowing. Um, our shoes are broken, but we've um, but we've got we've got to keep going. And it's a song which uses a um, original Russian tune, Katyusha which you uh, may or may not know. Phil, can I, can I take you back one? Can I take you back even earlier? You can, yeah. I, I read the Bella Ciao kind of potentially has roots in the Mondine, the, like, the, the paddy fields. The Mondine were the, the weeds, I think. The weeds in the paddy fields, and they were being farmed by the women in the late 19th century. And there's a sense that I thought that, the, that like some of the lyrics about kind of, I don't know, the boss with its cane and the early in the morning. There's some lyrics in there in the in the original. I get up to the rice paddy fields. I, I, I thought that might, I'd understood that there might even be an earlier history to that song. Yes, it, it is true that, um, that one of the kind of lines of inquiry has, has been that uh, there would seem to be um, uh, songs sung by the rice pickers um, I suppose, originating in the late 19th century, uh, in which they were sort of lamenting their conditions of work, um, having to get up incredibly early, working in appalling conditions, uh, quite frequently, of course, contracting malaria and, and earning very little money. So th- th- there are songs and different versions of songs which, which are very similar to, to, to Bella Ciao. And, uh, and so, yeah, we can see, I suppose, the roots of, of this song 
But the actual lyrics of the Bella Chow that um, that we sing, I'm not talking about the Chumba Wumba version or various others as well, but the but the one that refers to the partisans, you know, that is to the Second World War period. So it's like it's an adaptation. It's 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 using a song and 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 uh, lyrics that that, that pre existed, but then adapting it to the context of of the Second World War. You you see this phenomenon happening with 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 all sorts of songs. It's the same with the one that Fisky Vento that I mentioned just a, a minute or two ago you know it's originally a russian tune but then uh, you know kind of italian lyrics are, are, are introduced and that and that tune is then employed and uh, works extremely well actually with the lyrics so okay so i'm gonna go back once i'm gonna just clarify that because i think you've really helped me understand it so Good. there is probably a melody that comes from the paddy fields the yeah. mondine that that was adapted during world war ii by the partisans fighting fighting against Mussolini um, and and the lyrics of the partisan with these, you know, one morning I awakened and I had the found the invader, a partisan carry me away because yeah. I feel death feel that death's approaching or whatever those lyrics are. That was emerged either during the war or after the war. That's right, emerged during the war and uh, immediately afterwards. And then there's a long and, and complicated process, really, I suppose, from 1945 up to the present day in which the song has had its kind of ups and downs and and you know almost gone silent and then been relaunched um i mean when i originally uh, started teaching the, the resistance um the history of the resistance at, at, at my university I, I look for versions of bella ciao and you know actually you know predating the web can you believe it and uh, it was very difficult to find um, a, um, a version of the song. In fact, the only one that I could find was 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 a was an all female chorus singing Bella Ciao in a really kind of dirge like fashion, in a way that would almost send you to sleep. Um, but what you've got now on on the web and on YouTube, above all, are, are thousands of um, of versions. I mean, I I I, I listened to one by a, a Hungarian punk band um, just earlier on this afternoon. It's really interesting that you were you, you just mentioned this sort of female this female choral. At- choral version of it because i was wondering about the gender aspect of it because it's fascinating to me that these were it was largely a a women's job to be working in the paddy fields like this is a female the origins of the song may be female and then presumably it during the war it became it became i don't know gender neutral or perhaps more male um with these resistance fighters partisans does that get thread through like even in like the italian with the kind of gender endings does it just can you hear it in the in the lyrics well i'm actually i'm glad you asked (laughs) asked this question because i mean one of the things that there's always been a problem for me with with Bella Chow is that it's about you know it's about a young man who decides to join the partisans you know and he says goodbye to uh, his his girlfriend you know Bella Chow and and it's as if he leaves her behind right he goes up into the hills he does all the fighting and uh, and you know in a sense you know she's left to pick up the pieces and indeed to bury him if um if 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 he gets killed and uh, it gives you the idea that the resistance was something that was uh, entirely done by men which isn't actually the truth at all i mean there, there there were women who participated actively in the resistance you know shouldering uh rifles but they were also an absolutely integral part of the whole you know organization of of the resistance movement i mean in, in some cases there were actual sort of resistance um leaders in in Turin and around Turin uh, exactly uh, for example that's just 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 one case but the women as well were you know very much in, in, involved in supplying information food uh you know dealing with the, with the injured partisans and so in a sense the problem with with Bella Ciao from sort of my perspective well it's absolutely a brilliant song uh, it it does t- tend to give you this idea that the the resistance in in Italy was ju- was was purely the domain of men which it wasn't. Right. And particularly fascinating if actually it was the women who originally sang the song. One day will come, the day will come when we'll all work in, work in our freedom. The Mondino, the rice pickers obviously originally uh, sang, sang that version of the song, but then, then the partisans started singing. I mean, of course, these days, um, it's sung by everyone. I was reading earlier today that there were a bunch of, like during quarantine, during the COVID quarantines in Italy, they, they it, the song was sung from the balconies. That's right. Yeah, you're, you're right. I, I do remember seeing that on the uh, the, the Italian news. Um, it was really quite moving. I, I have to say to, to to hear them to hear these sort of uh, strains of Bella Ciao 
wafting across, as you say, the, particularly the internal balconies that you get in uh, in Italy, so everybody could um, could could hear each other. I mean, yes, it it, it has really resurfaced um, over the last um, the last few years. But I guess there's an interim there's an interim period for the song, which comes after it's writing and it's and it's transcribing um, after the war, when presumably it had been a partisan song sung against the kind of main pol- main political st- kind of state in the during the war and then it became it, it was it became normalized presumably did it as, as a song uh, after the war as italy as italy tried to kind of set kind of re-establish itself or just kind of to kind of that was so split during the war it must have yeah. gone through it you know i guess that's another podcast in itself trying to understand how it, italy managed to unite itself again after that absolutely um, but did the song yeah. was the song part of that unification well, I mean, one of the key things about the song is that, is that it it actually it doesn't refer to the fascists, okay, uh, and so it doesn't give the impression that the resistance was a fight between between the resistance between the partisans and and the fascists. It, it doesn't at all speak of the the civil war that took place in Italy from 43 to, to 45. It talks about, you know, in that first line, El trovato l'invasor, the invader, as in the, as in the German, right? And there's, this, there's no reference to, to, the, to the fascists throughout. And this, in many ways, is actually quite convenient because, you know, after the war, you it, Italians and, and not, you know, any country that's experienced a civil war is, 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 is wanting to get over the fact that uh, people, even from the same family, were fighting against and in, in some cases killing each other. So, you know, Bella Ciao is quite a convenient song in the sense that it's, it's, it's all about uh, the German invader, you know, the bad German, if you like, and the, and the, good, and the good Italian. And so, you know, that means that the, the, the song is kind of acceptable in a context in which talking about fascism and talking about violence, if you like, was um, was really quite difficult, particularly in the 1950s. But um, I think it's still the case that probably the most popular partisan song in this in this earlier period period, the first decade or so, isn't Bella Ciao at all. It's it's Fischi Vento, the one I mentioned um, earlier, um, which is a song which is actually far more politically charged as well. What what happens with Bella Ciao is that is that it it kind of gets relaunched in the 1960s. Um, there's um, uh, 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 various um, Italian kind of songwriters, folklorists as well, who get together after uh, 1960, and um, they they start putting together uh, shows and, um, uh, and and concerts with resistance songs in them. And Bella Ciao is one of the songs that um, that, are, that is that is sung uh, famously at, at the uh, the Festival of the Two Worlds in, in Spoleto in the early 1960s. And it seems to be that moment when um, when 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 Bella Ciao starts to become far more widespread. And then um, it gets picked up outside of Italy as well. So Yves Monton, the the uh, the, the French crooner. Uh, sings sings Bella Ciao, and again you 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 can hear him on YouTube uh, performing it. And uh, I found a, a letter um, in the Communist Party newspaper from the, the mid nineteen sixties, in in which the uh, the writer of the letter says, "Listen, you know, Yves Montand's version of Bella Ciao has reached Siberia." He says, "It's reached it's reached Siberia." So it's this sort of combination in the in the sixties, I think it is that um, that that sees Bella Chow then starting to, uh, to to become a far more widespread um, uh, song and a far more sort of internationally known song as well. So, so my 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 kind of friends who grew up in the Soviet Union tell me that they used to sing this song at school, so they hate it. Right. But it's interesting to me that at some point this song, which was sort of an anti-fascist song, becomes a kind of by default then a pro-communist song does it how does that link happen <laughs> it, it's always been associated with the political left that la Chao. partisan songs in general have, have always been associated with the um, political left you know somebody like monton 
um, as well would have no trouble with that. Uh, I'm sure that um, and probably, as you're saying, in, in the Soviet Union, if it became popular in, in the Soviet Union, in, in the well, you, your friends uh, wouldn't have been singing the song in the 1960s. I'm, assume, I'm assuming it's actually far more recent in the, in the 70s and 80s. And so, so, by that, so by that stage, it's become embedded, if you like, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Soviet youth culture. But it's it's always been seen um, because the resistance has always been associated with the, with the left as well. I mean, they weren't all communists. Let's be clear. But I mean, the majority of people that participated in the resistance fought in communist organized brigades. So the song the song's always been yeah. associated with the um, with the, with the political left. I mean, you know, but by the way, I mean, you, you really need to make a distinction between the Italian communists and and the Soviet communists as well. I mean, they're an entirely different animals. And so, yeah, so a song of the left, a, a song of protest, a, so, a song which has been used in in many many different contexts. I mean, in the early two thousands, it's it's used as a song, an anti Berlusconi song. Yeah. So when Berlusconi comes to power, which is the second government, it is a, um, an Italian television um, presenter, Santoro, sings it at the start of one of his programs because uh, he fears that he's going to be censored by and perhaps even fired from the state television channel for um, for what they accused him of, 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 of doing, which was um, giving um, biased um, political opinions. And so Santoro wanders about the, the studio uh, in during the opening title sequence, singing ba- singing it very badly as well and out, and out of tune. But you know, there, it's, you know, it's, it's seen, all right, okay, so Bella Chow, you know, associated with protests, associated with all the attempts to, to stop Berlusconi. It's a political act, isn't it? He did mm. it as a political act. It's not even it's not even a rousing chorus to try and rally the troop. Well, maybe it was. Maybe that's what he was trying to do. Well, I mean, it could be it could it can be a political act, as as we say. Also, all the the children on their school trips in Italy in the nineteen eighties and 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 before then, they you know they'd all sing it, irrespective of where they came from politically. You know, so there might be there might be the sons and daughters of card carrying Christian Democrats, but you know they'd still sing they'd still sing Bella Ciao because it's a, it's such a great song. It's a thumping song. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed hearing Philip's unravelling of the song's long and sprawling history from the rice fields to the resistance and into the classrooms. I also wanted to understand how important Bella Ciao still is in Italy and how the younger generation who didn't grow up during times of war respond to the song today. I was lucky enough to speak with Virginia Cirolli, a singer who gives us both a beautiful rendition of Bella Ciao at the end of this podcast and shares the amazing story of her grandfather's fight for the resistance. Virginia, do you have a connection with Bella Ciao? And if so, why is it important for you? I do. I do have a strong connection to that song, actually, um, because my granddad... Uh, was um, a part of the Italian resistance um, when the song was sung by the um, Italian army at the time in the resistance um, in the Second World War. Um, So I remember him singing that song from time to time and telling me about it um, and how it was something that they kept on singing to just keep going, which is actually interesting because it wasn't originally written for the you know, the famous reason we know it for. It's not for the World War II. It was written by women, props to them, uh, because it's a beautiful song, by Mondina, which is um, rice paddy female workers. Um, And it was against their uh, harsh working conditions. And then the song has been adapted uh, for the the reason we know it's famous for. Um, So yeah, it's quite dear to me because I know that my granddad did risk his life um, during World War II um, to fight... uh, Uh, against, uh, of course, the um, uh, Germany at that time. Um, So it's very dear to me uh, to hear that song and sing that song. What's an amazing connection for you with the the music? Where was your grandfather fighting? Uh, He was in the Alps uh, in North uh, Italy. That's where um, the resistance was most of the time. Um, So I remember him telling me about uh, how he was hiding there. And um, he, at one point, he almost got uh, caught by the, the Germans. Uh, that arrived um, but he was saved by an Italian lady because she hid him in the 
uh, seller of her house. Um, and it was a really close call. And he always told me about those adventures and stuff like that. And if it wasn't for that lady, he wouldn't be there today. And I wouldn't <laughs> be there either. That's extraordinary. And and how and, and, and you've been have you been singing it then as part of your musical repertoire? Let's say I sing maybe like more opera songs as part of my repertoire because my granddad, the same granddad, was an opera singer later on in his life. Um, so that's the kind of music that I grew up listening to. Um, but every time I hear it, whether it's, uh, I mean, recently we've, we've heard it everywhere because of uh, Money Heist. Uh, they brought that song uh, back to life. So I've been hearing it and, you know, every time it makes me go back to that, um, to my granddad and hearing him. Is there something about the music that you love too, or is it just that it's the connection, it's the direct connection to your grandfather and the family link? Of course, there is this connection with my granddad and with my family directly, but I think it's looking at the lyrics of the song and how they're still quite relevant today. I've asked my family what they thought about the song as well, and if it's relevant for them, because of course I have my point of view, but I didn't have theirs. Um, and I had some mixed answers actually some of people in my family didn't really attach to the song and some people said some really interesting things uh, my mom said something along the lines of um this song is to defend the people that defended themselves um and i really liked uh, her way of seeing it i'm personally quite inspired by that song because it makes me think of the people that stood for what they thought was right, even though they were in the minority at the time. Um, and it inspires me to do so as well. Mm. It's a song that can be quite relevant uh, nowadays uh, with everything that's going on in the world. And when you're in a minority, this song directly is a celebration of them as well. I think that's absolutely beautifully and powerfully put. Are there particular, lyri are there particular lyrics that move you? Uh, I would say, I mean, it's quite cliche, but the last uh, let's say four lines e questo il fiore del partigiano oh bella ciao bella ciao bella ciao 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 e questo il fiore del partigiano morto per la libertà um, and it's basically about um, what it says in English. The translation is literally, this is the flower of the partisan. Oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao. This is the flower of the partisan who died for freedom. And it's that last line that really um, resonates with me because, you know, uh, some people, unlike my granddad, did not survive uh, what they were fighting for. And I think it's a great way of celebrating uh, these people that fought and literally gave their lives for something that, um, they thought was right. And I think that's something that personally, I wouldn't be able to go to that extent for something that I want to fight for. I don't know if I would have the courage to go up until giving up my life for something that strongly and that willingly. Um, and that's something that we have to remember that some people did that for us and to arrive where we are today. <laughs> and it's a beautiful lyric, but also it is phenomenal that we pay tribute so collectively because that song is the song. When you hear those, song, those songs being sung in moments of mass protest, we're all collectively remembering the people that died yeah. for us which is exactly. just phenomenal yeah it is it is a beautiful song and i think it's really important to always come back to the actual lyrics um because some sometimes the song is used in a very uh good and uh, in a good way as in, in money heist i see why they chose that song um and sometimes it's not used in in the correct way i would say or like they don't look at uh where it came from or, or why. So it really depends on the use I think it's, it's made of. But of course, in uh, protests, uh, when we're fighting for freedom uh, or we're fighting for independence, um, the, the use of the song for me is completely right. And it, it's really a, a breathtaking <laughs> to hear it mm. sang live, of course. I, I agree. I had this kind of phenomenal moment at the weekend when I was, I stumbled unintentionally on a protest in like in Hampstead Heath it was it was this kind of collective rabble of people who were all protesting uh, about different things I mean I think it was a kind of anti anti-establishment march that was going on that was crossing London they were protesting about all the kind of you know like the uh, the kind of legal world in which we're living with bills of rights and covid covid rules and basically all of the great dissenters of of, of London had all joined together and it was very funny it was a very funny march it was great to be kind of stumble onto but as I was walking I was walking like the other way through through Hampstead Heath as they were walking past me so I saw loads of them 
And then there was a guy with a recorder who played Bella Ciao as I passed Amazing. him. And it was it was so phenomenal. It was just I, I, I mean like, I almost turned around to him and said, How did you know? How did you know I'm doing this <laughs> podcast about this song right now? Uh, no, I really and I wanted to record it like but I didn't have my phone with me. So it was just a moment, but it, it was a moment that um felt very special that I hope I hope that it was absolutely intentional by his part that he was fighting for freedom through his music. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I loved Virginia's passion for Bella Ciao and her belief that it can and should be shared as a protest song for the world. And also Philip's argument that it can bring people together across politics and smooths down divides. I've come across some incredible versions of Bella Ciao across the world. Returning to Philip, it's an easy song to sing, and Bella Ciao is just is a, is, is a catchy, a catchy and accessible phrase. But it has been translated into other languages. Like I, I um, I came across a video of it being sung in Punjabi in India recently in the protests against the closing down of the big, the big kind of markets that were that were being the government was trying to set close down in for the farmers in Punjab. And I, I'm aware that it has this amazing ability to transfer itself into other languages and other countries. Um, are there versions that you've come across in strange parts of the world? Well, I, I think I mentioned earlier that I, I, I heard a Hungarian um, uh, version of it just um, earlier on today. And as you say, there, there, there are lots of versions. But, I, you know, I, th- I think the thing is, though, that, yeah, you, you, ca- you can translate it, but it's still actually easy to sing in Italian. The lyrics are quite straightforward. It's quite, it's quite easy to, 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 to remember the lyrics because... You know, it, it tells a story which is easy enough to follow. And so, you know, while there are, as you say, lots and lots, lots and lots of translations and people are always wanting to know, well, what the hell, what the hell does it mean? It's actually a relatively straightforward song to, to remember in Italian. And of course, thumping out Bella Ciao is, um, is, is really straightforward. Every, everybody know, knows what Ciao means. Coming back to this point, the, the, I guess the sort of tension, uh, innate tension at the heart of the song, which is that it's both this song of protest against fascism and yet a great song. It kind of that plays itself out into into its more most famous recent cover of it which was the film money heist because which is obviously like a in some ways that's a it's a big glossy hollywood film isn't it it's like a it's a it's the kind of epitome of capitalism (laughs) Um, is there some discomfort about it being about it being appropriated for 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 for, for hollywood i don't think so to be honest i think there's manufactured discomfort if you like, I've, I've read various articles on, on the web in which it says, ah, oh, yeah, everybody's sort of jumping up and down and clapping their hands and singing this song. But the older generation were, are not happy. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that is, uh, in any way a, a, a reflection of the, of the truth. I think, I think the fact, um, that the, the Casa de Papel has, has, you know, done a lot to, to, to make young, particularly young people, um, aware of this song, you know, perhaps even, um, understanding that it's got some connection with, um, with the Italian resistance movement, um, is great. I should clarify, of course, it's not Hollywood. It's just, it, but it, but it, it was a, it was a, you know, it's a big Spanish, it's a Spanish big drama, isn't it? It's a big drama, but you know, the song. The, the, I mean, they use the song in in uh, at, at key mo- at key moments uh, during uh, certain episodes. I think one of them is actually entitled "Bella Ciao." I think it's extraordinarily powerful. I mean, I've got, I've got no problem with the, with with the song being used in um in in money heist i mean it just happens to have coincided as well with um with the you know e- enormous expansion of it and, and use of it in lots of other places in in protests in in greece um this 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 have you heard about the sardines by by any chance the sardine protest movement um in italy this is from just a few years ago that all they carry uh, in, into the squares. There's no plaques. They just they just carry images of, of of sardines because there are so many of them packed into the squares, protesting against the um, uh, you know some of the, the right wing political parties in Italy and, uh, and above all the leader of uh, of what's called the League, a guy called uh, Salvini, and they all, they all sing. Bella Ciao, and I think you know, in a sense, this is this is this is ridden on the su- the success of um, of Money Heist. So, you know, more power to yeah, them. that's great. It's great. It's feeding. It's feeding it. I haven't seen the sardines protest, but I have seen vid- videos on YouTube of um, thousands of people in Gezi Park in Turkey singing Bella Ciao. I think Grupo Yorum. Yeah. It's like a big 
popular Turkish mm-hmm. Turkish group um, pl- played it as part of their you know in in Gezi Park and thousands yeah. of people singing that song and it's incredibly powerful. Is there a particular verse that you like? Well, I I think the final the final verse you see where you um you, you go you know, e questo fiore del partigiano morto per la libertà and ending on that um uh, that that line is um is is great you know the 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 the, em- the emphasis on the the sacrifice that they made in fighting for liberty i mean it it does mean that you that you go out on a, on a high i mean it's um there's a sadness to it as well but um there's there's this there's this very sort of sense that it's politically charged and um, yeah yeah it does because I'm just you're absolutely I right I think you need to shout more to Bella Libertad it does finish like that doesn't it mm-hmm. it does it goes down for Libertad mm-hmm. that's right yeah I'd forgotten that yeah. in my mind in mm-hmm. my mind it just goes round Bella Ciao Bella Ciao Bella Ciao 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 but it doesn't it finishes mm-hmm. with that moment yeah that's a beautiful end mm-hmm. and very final deliberately so It's not just the creative team at Money Heist that love Bella Chow. I discovered that the composer Orlando Goff had recently been working with the song. The reason why we picked up the phone to you was because my partner went to the Globe to see Much Do About Nothing and he just reflected to me afterwards. He started, he started this great version of Bella Chow and I was like, OK, I'm going to track down Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, there we are. Yeah, it's a song. It's a song I've curiously got very obsessed with, which is odd, you know, because... It's not an English folk song, it's an Italian folk song, and it's, you know, in a way far from my own culture, but I, I completely identify with almost everything in it, everything in it, in fact. And um, so when we started working on Much Ado About Nothing and the, the director, Lucy Bailey, decided to set it at the end of the Second World War in northern Italy, and the piece, Much Ado About Nothing, begins at the end of a war. I mean, in Shakespeare's original version, it's a kind of unspecified war. Um, and in Lucy's version, it's the Second World War. Um, and we're in northern Italy, so the fighters are, part of, are partisans. It took me about seven seconds to decide that Bella Ciao <laughs> had to be there. In Much Do About Nothing, the, the war is... I think a very important, it's, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant idea um, that the play begins like that because it's as if men and women haven't been allowed to be together for five years. And so that there's a feeling at, at the end of the war of an, an enormous feeling of excitement. But at the same time, there's a kind of wariness. Uh, the men have been away for so long um, and the women and the men have been leading such different lives. Um, that that kind of imbues that what happens next with, with a real, ama- a really amazing tension. That's a brilliant introduction, Orlando. Thank you. The other thing that my partner said was, was there was this amazing all-female accordion band. The band didn't much do about nothing. It's my idea of complete heaven. Uh, I love the accordion as an instrument. And, he, and in this band, there are five accordion players and they're all women. The, what happened is that in, in Shakespeare's version of Much Ado About Nothing, the piece begins in the palazzo of a man called Leonardo, and he has a brother, Antonio. In our version, it's Leonata, it's a woman who's in charge of the palazzo, and she has a sister, Antonia. Now, some, you know, sometimes those gender transformations in Shakespeare can be very tricky, I think. Um, but this, I think, is a completely brilliant idea because it means that at the very beginning of the play, that it's a world of women um, and they haven't seen men for a long time. And then at the very beginning of the play, we see this world of women and the first thing that happens in the play is that a messenger comes in and we don't know whether it's good news or bad news. And he sings the first two verses of Bella Chow in a kind of tentative it's kind of wary, knackered, actually, version. He's covered with blood. And you don't, so you just don't know whether it's good news or bad news. Um, and then he delivers the news, and it's basically good news. They're, they're doing well. The partisans are doing well. The war might end soon, and there haven't been many losses. Um, and then soon after, 
the men turn up, actually turn up, and they roar into the auditorium, into the yard of the of the Globe um, on motorcycles, singing a really exuberant version of the song. And then the women join in, and we imagine that all these people know this song really well. And the accordion band joins in, and you get this you get this moment of sheer joy and exuberance and relief. And what's so brilliant about that song is that it has a kind of incredible, I think, a very ambiguous quality because it's it has a kind of melancholy somewhere inside it. That's in a minor key for a start. And yet it has a fantastic energy and therefore implies hope. I think it's a kind of glorious ambiguity about the song. Do you think it's that ambiguity, that ability to straddle those different kinds of emotions, which make it a successful protest song? I do, actually. I think, it, I mean, it's, for me, it's a kind of perfect protest song because it in some way expresses the, the hell of your current life. Um, and yet, because of its energy and its momentum, it manages to give hope. And I think that is a kind of perfect protest song. The, of course, you can do many, di- very many different versions of it, very many different arrangements. I mean, Mary Hopkin did a very kind of wistful arrangement of it, which actually works really well. And then we get a Goran Bregovich version, which is just kind of pure exuberance, pure joy. And then in between, we get we get kind of angry versions, we get savage versions, we get kind of versions where where, the, where it's quite ambiguous. And and I feel that that kind of that makes a really good protest song because part of the point I guess of singing a song at a protest march is to kind of give yourselves hope actually is to is to and to feel like a, a community. It completely it, does, it that. does that really well. It completely does that, and you obviously explored that through yeah. having that solo voice coming on and then being joined by the ensemble towards the end. Yes, yes, because as a solo piece, it can be extremely melancholic. I mean, it works very well if you sing it very slowly, and then it can pick up. In, in much told about nothing, quite soon they have a party to celebrate, um, and, and then Bella Chow kind of gets into this party. Uh, it sort of it introduces itself into a wild dance, a kind of tarantella that they dance, and then and then we hear it again in a in a, sli- in a slightly more melancholic version as Benedict is kind of wandering about baffled in the party and then right at the end of the party there's a kind of two o'clock in the morning version of it a rather beautiful kind of go back to a solo female singer Um, and so I've (laughs) I've used it as much as I conceivably could without driving people completely around the bend and I must say at the end of the party the war in that play is out of the way and actually (laughs) you can't use it again I love that you you went on that journey from the solo voice to the ensemble and through back to its beginning again but it through a different voice what a beautiful metaphor for the play yes um it's. I mean, I think you could accuse me of just being a little bit too obsessed uh, with the song, but it is quite nice that actually through that party, you're you're moving into a situation where we're thinking entirely really about love and sex, but that the war is just there still. It's affected everything that's going on, so it feel it felt right to keep the song going. You've now claimed an obsession. Twice in the course of the conversation. What what is it about it that that, that makes you that, that obsesses you? Um, one of the things that interests me as a composer in it is the structure of the lyrics of the song. That it hasn't got what you would normally call a chorus. It just has a series of verses. But the second line of each verse is the same. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. So it acts. I think in in the same way as a chorus, it's a very unusual structure. You, you occasionally get it in folk songs, um, and it gives an amazing every time it comes. It gives an amazing lift to each verse, so that the verse each verse starts off in a way quite tentatively with two little phrases which are identical in a minor key, and then you get oh bella ciao bella ciao bella ciao ciao ciao. And, and you get your first harmonic change and you get this kind of lift and momentum in each verse. And then the last two lines, you get a complete surge. And every, so every verse has this big kind of emotional moment halfway through. And that is pretty brilliant for a folk song. 
some folk songs, which are only just verses, can get really dull. You, there, there are those kind of storytelling folk songs which have got 24 identical, musically identical verses. And, you, and it's okay, except you're just longing for something else. But somehow in this, because you get this lift out of the, out of the second line of each verse every time, it really is very, very exciting. And it's the combination of that lift and the fact that it's the same lines each time um, and, and it's a repeat of the same word. That's why it's so successful as a protest song, because the ensemble can join in for those moments. Because what's interesting for me about this song, and the reason why I was interested in the internationality as well, is how widely these songs have travelled. So when you start looking at Bella Chow as a song, it has been translated into Hindi and then translated into Turkish and translated into yes. Russian. But often the Bella Chow stays the Bella Chow. So that like, you know, so that you'll, it'll be sung in, yes. you know, I've seen it sung at protests in Gezi park but the court that refrain mm. is still bella chow and then everyone can join in with bella chow whatever they are yeah it's a brilliant kind of call and response thing because normally it, that kind of call and response you have somebody singing the verse and then everybody sings the chorus in this case everybody's you get one line and then everybody can come charging in and give the whole thing the lift and you don't need, you don't have to know any of the rest of the, the words and of course, it's, incre it's incredibly memorable. If you talk to people about the song, they just immediately go, oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao. I mean, just you can't help it. And the fact that it's the same words every time means it's much more memorable, I think, than it would be if it were different words in each verse. I think that's totally right. I, I, uh, came, across, I came across the other day a, a wonderful version in Punjabi, uh, a Punjabi version of it, which has been sung. Do you know about this? It's been sung recently uh, to protest against farming laws in, in India. I found that version too. It's an extraordinary version of it. It's an extraordinary version of it. And he's completely changed the words, actually. He hasn't even kept, oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao. And it's quite a kind of, quite a sort of wistful, kind of held back version of it. Talk about kind of non-violent protest. It's wonderfully held back. It's a kind of satyagraha version of the of the song. Um, and uh, I, I noticed it's actually, it got, it got involved in the big protests in Delhi. And then, and then it's become a big thing in the Punjab now because, because the local government have got some really fearsome, horrible farming laws that they're bringing in. And so it's still being, still being used. And then what happens is, which I really like, is that that's inspired a whole lot of kind of wild Bangra versions of the song, including some kind of daft ones with all about roti <laughs> and things like that. And I think it's really great. And it's also really great because, of course, it, it brings, because it's a farming protest and it brings it right back to the original Mondina versions of the 19th century, which were about the rice fields. So there's something really brilliant about the fact that it's gone from northern Italy in 1890 or something like that to the Punjab. Um, same song, same problems, basically, uh, just different <laughs> lyrics in a different language. Oh, Linda, you couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. I completely agree with you. I think that's what, that's what for me, is so exciting about this song is its potential it's it, it is ability to remain re relevant and and adapt re adapt over the, like a lot more than a hundred years is phenomenal, and I think it's something about the simplicity of it of the uh, simplicity of those lyrics that and the, and the melody the folk melody that enable it to happen. I was thinking about what you were saying about the ambiguity of its music and its ability to be interpreted in different ways, and I think that's what it, that that's its strength, as you say. I mean, that means that wherever you are, whatever you're prot protesting about, you can make it relevant to your situation. That's absolutely true. It, very often without changing the words. So, I mean, which is odd because because in the partisan version, it's it's very particular. <laughs> Keeps going oh partigiano, but it somehow doesn't matter. It's fine. It, it still works. I wanted to ask when you were talking about yeah. everyone coming in with the refrain, a bella ciao refrain. Uh, does has that happened in 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 the globe? Uh, mm. uh, do people do people kind of just people sing it back to the uh, to the performers? Yeah, it, well, it's yeah, it's interesting because the, the globe uh, has a very wide ranging audience, a lot of tourists and a, and a lot of so a lot of Italian tourists would turn up, um, and they will really know the song. Um, so actually there, you can watch people 
particularly people in the yard, you know, the, the bit where everybody's standing in front of the stage, that you can watch people just kind of taken over by the song. And of course, they know the lyrics. And they're actually not entirely sure whether to join in because, uh, it's, because theater. it's yeah. <laughs> that's a theatre. Um, uh, they probably would later in the piece because it's that kind of theatre where you do join in. And so they're, they're hovering they're hovering and you can tell, you can see them miming the words and occasionally joining in. And it's really, it's really moving, I think, to see, uh, to see people who, for whom it's so much part of their culture, um, accepting that there it is in a play, you know, play in English, but suddenly they hear these people singing Bella Ciao in gorgeous. Italian. It's lovely. It's gorgeous. Great moment. I, I'm so thrilled that I, we reached out to you um, and tracked you down and like being able to, we're able to to hear that and also just to hear that how um how how long you've been waiting to, to do something with that song for is amazing yeah yeah it's true it's true uh yeah it's been it's kind of sits around in my head and it's such a good subject to be thinking about at the moment i think and 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 so good to be reminding people that protest is is possible and can uh, can work because i do think we lost track of it I remember going on the Iraq war protest and, and there was such a brilliant feeling there. It was such a huge protest and you felt this great wave of hope. And then it all just goes. So Tony Blair just goes, I couldn't care less about you two million people who are protesting, who bothered to protest. I'm just going to go ahead with this completely insane war. And then, and then, and I think people began to get out of the habit just thinking this just doesn't work. Like it's just not worth it. And I, I mean, I, I've been, I agree, I agree with you. And I, I've been watching Mike Lynch's um, speeches <laughs> the last few days, and just his his absolute power yeah. of certainty of conviction yeah. and the power with which he speaks is just incredibly yeah. inspiring. And um, I've also been thinking, strikes can work. And I, it looks like it's going to happen, actually, doesn't it? This summer, that the protests going to spread. Uh, and the strikes are going to spread because because everybody's in a really hard yeah, position. And we need more songs on the picket lines. We need more songs on the picket line. And it, I'm sure Bella Ciao will turn up somehow. <laughs> I have no doubt. La mattina mi son svegliato Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao Una mattina mi son svegliato E ho trovato l'invasor, o oh partigiano, portami via, o oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 o oh partigiano, portami via, che mi sento di morir. E se io muoio da partigiano, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. E se io muoio da partigiano, tu mi devi seppellir, mi seppellire lassù in montagna. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 mi seppellire lassù in montagna, sotto l'ombra. Radi un bel fior e le genti che passeranno. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. E le genti che passeranno mi diranno che bel fior. E questo è il fiore del partigiano. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. E questo è il fiore del partigiano morto per la libertà. Huge thanks to Virginia Cirolli for her thoughts and rendition of Bella Ciao and also to Orlando Goth and Philip Cook for their inspiring and arousing contributions. Please go out and sing in the parks and on the picket lines this summer. And we'll be back shortly with more podcasts as we build towards our new production of Dido's Bar this autumn. In the meantime, you can find previous episodes, including the one on the Internationale, wherever you get your podcast, or by going to our podcast section on our website, dasharts.org.uk. And if you like the Dash Arts podcast, follow the show and share, and please leave us a review. It helps us to stay visible and would mean the world to us. The Dash Arts podcast is produced